my colleague is going to record this session so that we can share it afterwards. And um, this is for you to watch, review, and make sure you capture all the information, and then you can send it on to your friends and colleagues who need it as well. And um, we'll also send out the slides after, as always. Again, this is session 10 um, in our series. We're going to start with this brief introduction and then move very quickly into some electronic safety and patient monitors. Again, we're in a phase of this series where we're doubling back on some of the topics that you've asked the most questions about. Um, we wanna make sure that we answer all of them thoroughly and make sure that you're prepared to use what you've learned. Um, and we will hear some case studies from, again, the Addis Ababa Tegbara Telecommunication Conference team, um, Tariku and Debe. Um, they will be able to share a little about their experience in Ethiopia um, and some more applicable knowledge. If you're new around here, please remember that the foundation of our conversation is love and respect. Please respond kindly rather than react if you disagree. Um, please test your equipment ahead of time when you can. You can mute your microphone when you're not speaking in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, remember to unmute before speaking and also introduce yourself so we know who you are. Um, please speak clearly. If you're in a large room, get close to your microphone so we can hear you. Um, and if you have any issues at all, you can send us a chat here. You should see it either in the bottom bar or on the right-hand side. Um, and you can also email us at assisthtm at assistinternational.org. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Guna. I, um, we're going to talk about electrical safety using multimeter. Sorry guys, I've just been made aware that you cannot see the presentation. Um, Guna, how is this? Okay, now, no, it's still the same, Marin. Let me reset real quick. Better? Yep. Now is it good? Very yeah. Okay. Um, earlier we uh, talked about electrical safety analyzer in previous session. So when you talk about electrical safety analyzer, it's most of it, uh, you are talking about checking the leakage current and voltage, all that. So you are checking on the medical device with patient apply part by connecting to your electrical safety analyzer. So it's capable of measuring AC, DC, leakage on the circuit, all that. So that's the advantage of an electrical safety analyzer. You can do simulate single fault condition, normal condition, all that. And it measure a smaller leakage current. That's the advantage of an electrical safety analyzer with standards of IEC 60601 and AME, all that. When you try to use multimeter as a safety analyzer, there's a lot, lot of advantage and disadvantage. So like you want to measure live voltage, so you need to do modification on the direction for neutral and earth removal, all that. So it'll be very dangerous on the medical device. When you do this type, this type of uh, removing connection, the disadvantage when you try to create single fault, that'll be a dangerous part of it because you are removing nitro all that. So chances of you to get electrocuted is very high. But the the thing is, your know, multimeter is normally you do direct measurement. You cannot create a single fault condition without any modification. So you you need to do like remove nitro to get that particular reading. So earth bonding measurement, you need to have a, a good quality multimeter that's stable with the reading, all that. The, another disadvantage uh, with the multimeter is you cannot measure uh, the current 
used by the device because if you want to do that particular part, you need to do certain uh, removal connection and you have to do series connection. But at the same time, your multimeter is not capable on the higher current measurement. So that's a disadvantage. And you, uh, most of the direct leakage current level, AC and DC, you need to have a direct measurement of microamps. So your electrical safety analyzer do direct measurement, but with multimeter, you cannot do direct micro, micro amp measurement. You need to convert one millivolt equal to one micro amp. So that's another issue that you're going to face. So you need to have an external circuit, uh, a resistor and capacitor to get the binding of the equivalent to impedance to do, is, to do measurement on leakage. We'll, I'll show you the di diagram of the particular circuit later. And uh, you cannot do certain apply part due to safety issue, like uh, main on apply part you cannot do because the, the leakage current of uh, high voltage can electrocute all that. So normally MEP try to avoid doing. So first step, earth bonding is very straightforward measurement, but before that you can do measuring incoming voltage from your line voltage by setting your multimeter on VAC, then uh, you can do a direct measurement. For earth bonding, you need to do measurement from the plug point without powering up the device from the plug point on the earth section for class one and to the equation uh, on the bonding of the earth line on the medical device. If you see at the equipotential point on the medical device, that will be at the back of the medical device. So you measure from there to the earth section of your plug point by using the ohms resistance measurement. You can do that particular measurement or continuity test, and the resistance should be less than zero point three. So leakage current test. When you talk about leakage current test, you need to create this particular circuit and you need to connect with your millivolt. The reason is most of your multimeter impedance and uh, it's normally uh, is somewhere one mega ohm thing. So you need to do the volt setting according to the one mega. Most of the multimeter that you are using, the good ones, the impedance is one mega, remember that. So you need to do one kilo ohm resistor with a capacitor of 0 0.5 in parallel condition. And you need to connect your multimeter between them. So you can see the diagram. So every, then you have to set your multimeter to two millivolt setting. And every one millivolt is equal to one microampere. Remember that. So these are uh, normally we do it on the metrology calculation for measuring electrical. It's a direct conversion millivolt to current. So leakage current test you can do normal condition, single fault condition you can do, but there's a lot of issue that you need to consider when you're doing the removing cable, all that you have to consider. Or you can use extension plug point by removing neutral, earth, all that, create a single fault condition on the plug point, on the extension plug point. So when you do, you, when you're using the circuit, Normally, you can do earth leakage current, touch current, and patient leakage current. These are things that you can do with this particular circuit. So, class one, 
when you talk about class one, you can measure earth leakage current test. So these are the connection from the medical device. You have to connect to your ground connection of your medical equipment. You have to remove the connection and uh, by using this circuit, you have to connect to the earth line. So from there, you can measure the leakage current of the dirt device. On the normal condition, it should be less than 0 0.5 milliampere. So it's equivalent to 0 0.5 millivolt actually. Because your reading is 1 millivolt equal to 1 microamp. So this is how do you do for normal condition. And single fault condition, you have to remove open neutral. So what, what you need to do is you have to open up a neutral line and measure the particular reading. So this, these are condition of the measurement. For touch current, touch current is, you do it on class one and class two device. So normal condition, you can do like a normal thing, like from PE to your equipment where normally your touch point from there you you do the connection and you measure the leakage current so if for b bf and cf for normal condition the leakage current should be less than 0 0.1 milliampere and single fault condition for class one should be less than 0 0.5 milliampere Single fault condition for open neutral should be 0 0.5. So these are condition that you need to do for touch current. Patient leakage current for class one and class two. These are, you are checking the apply part section. So when you talk about normal condition, it should be B and BF. 0 point, less than 0 0.1. So you see the connection from protective earth. You need to remove the earth line from your medical device, connect to the circuit, and connect to the apply part. For example, ECG cables. Then the millivolt is your multimeter. And you do the measurement. You can see these are, we call it as a group measurement. So normal condition, you can see 0 0.1 milliampere for B and BF and 0 0.01 milliampere for CF. And single fault condition, open protective earth. So you can see the earth is already open line. So for class one, leakage current should be less than 0 0.5 milliampere for B and BF and 0 0.05 milliampere for CF. And single fault condition when you do open neutral, it's almost the same 0 0.5 milliampere for B and BF and 0 0.05 milliampere for CF. These are on reverse polarity condition. So this, these are things that you can do by using multimeter, but you have to be careful. Quite a lot of uh, risks that you need to look into it, like uh, open neutral, all this, the connection. If you wrongly do it, you can get electrocuted, but you, you can still measure the leakage current. So this is the checklist. So if you see, all this measurement one millivolt equal to one micro m so i'm using the same checklist but only thing uh, you are you are limited to measure like uh, main voltage earth, earth resistance earth leakage current enclosure patient leakage current lead to earth leakage current so this the only measurement that you can do this is good enough to measure leakage current on your equipment actually So next topic will be disinfection patient monitor. So 
when you talk about uh, disinfection and uh, cleaning patient monitor, always try to use uh, clean with a lean free cloth. And if you got warm water, like 14 degrees Celsius, or soap diluted, detergent, dishwash, all that, and alcohol based cleaning agent, you can use that. So when you Doing a touch screen cleaning, always take extra care because touch screen is quite sensitive. And always remember, do not uh, allow the liquid uh, going seeping into the monitoring case, all that. Wipe around all, all the points clearly and do not allow water or cleaning solution enter the measurement connection, all the connection between the ECG cables, all that, a white water go into that particular connection. And make sure the connect, connect, connector all dry and clean. Okay, when you do cleaning, always remember there's a lot of precaution that you need to look into it. Like your module, multi-measurement, uh, modules, extension, uh, flexible module rack, cables, accessories always have to be free, free from dust and dirt. After cleaning and disinfection, check the equipment carefully. So you have always check uh, your diluted according to the manufacturing instruction using a uh, low possible concentration like the soap, all that, and do not allow liquid enter the casing, and check the accessories and liquid, uh, accessories, if that's anything touch with the liquid, keep, make sure you keep it clean and dry, and always avoid liquid enter the system or on the monitor, and uh, check on the uh, side cover, all that, and uh, be careful the liquid don't enter and do not use bleach. So when you do touch screen, always remember you can off the touch screen or uh, stop the switch. Uh, power mode after the cleaning you disable back and avoid liquid on the equipment and battery battery or accessories and the connectors on the module all that and uh, if you see these are dishwasher detergent that you can use there's some brand there and normally what you can do is you can get a from your local market dishwasher and uh, you can use that or you can use dilute ammonia less than three percent with windows cleaner or isoporin 70 percent and window window cleaner you can mix with it and water and you can use that to clean Okay, when you talk about a chemical that you can use for disinfection, do not mix solution like bleach and manure. You cannot mix this particular thing because it can uh, cause unwanted as a gas, all that. So you do not mix these two. Always be careful. It can uh, result of uh, some gas, all that and not comfortable to breathe. And uh, sometimes your hospital got disinfection uh, policy. Maybe you can talk to them and find out. And always uh, be careful what you're using. Always read the manual of the, read, read the in mixing that they're using. Avoid mixing a wrong thing. 
eventually can cause a lot of trouble, damage the equipment, all that. So cleaning the equipment before disinfection, always uh, use the alcohol base. So you can mix with ethanol up to 70% and all these uh, things that approve agent that you can use. Okay, now we're going to talk about patient monitor accessory cleaning. So these are one of the common thing that you face in hospital, like broken accessories, all that. Sometimes if you're going to use a wrong uh, disinfection uh, uh, things that eventually you're going to break the insulator, all that in the long run, it breaks all that because of the insulator become hard and damage the accessories. So when you talk about uh, like SPO2, all that blood pressure cuff, you always remember clean properly and cable. Then the O's always, when you wipe it, all that, make sure that you dry it properly. So always do not use ethanol alcohol to, to clean the cables, all this, because et ethanol is intent to break the ins insulator of the cables, all that. ECG cable, normally what happens is you're going to see the ECG gel that they use touch that particular cable and become uh, dry and hard, eventually break the insulator. So all this you need to be careful. And uh, SPO2 sensor, always use isoferrate alcohol solution. And you wipe with that and eventually let the particular sensor and the cable dry before you use it. So next is troubleshooting. So when you talk about troubleshooting, uh, normally you're going to see a power supply failure due to unstable power and battery failures. And uh, battery can lead the power supply fail due to the short circuit. So what happens is, uh, for example, you got a monitor and you're, you attach a battery together with the monitor. Eventually what happens is on, uh, on long run, after one year plus or something like that, the batteries start to fail. Eventually you need to remove the battery, but what happens is sometimes you intend to leave the battery inside the patient monitor. So eventually what, uh, the battery going to be short circuit or going to have some, some resistance, it going to affect your power supply due to the power supply start to work more, try to load more because of the load on the battery is still working, then the power supply can fail. At the same time, it can damage the casing of the patient monitor due to the battery start to expand. And uh, module failure of ECG and IBP device, uh, these are common thing, maybe because of wear and tear, sometimes it's not maintained properly and uh, Another common failure is NIBP pump on the module fail. That's another wear and tear thing. Then accessory failure or leak, like tubing, NIBP calf, all this. These are normal thing that you're going to see in hospital. So when you talk about NIBP, uh, if the user, user complain, the nurse or the doctor complain, the reading is inaccurate, all that. Normally you have to check uh, the calf size, whether they're using a correct calf size on the patient, an incorrect calf application, and arrhythmia in irregular heart rate, rapid change in pressure. Sometimes patient moving, movement, and uh, twitching and uh, shivering, all that can cause 
unwanted reading on the NIBP. And uh, calf are not placed on the heart level, on the proper level, that normally where you should put. So all these can cause inaccurate reading. So always check on this first before you go further. So NIBP failure, lack of reading. So uh, leak calf, inflate timeout alarm. This can can be uh, give, give you an inaccurate reading. Block or king tube always cause inaccurate reading, failure to get reading, uh, maybe overpressure alarm. So when you block anything, you're going to get overpressure alarm. Movement of muscle, abnormal heart rate, rhythm, weak pulse, pressure, sometimes it cause automated, the reading is obtained, uh, failed to obtain. So, this, these are common thing that you when you see most of the device have this particular issue because um, so it's wear and tear thing. Sometimes uh, you connect it pro uh, don't connect properly. Sometimes you get leak on the line. All these, these are common NIBP failure that you're going to see. So one of the common problem is your NIBP farm module problem. NIBP pressure casing broken. Sometimes uh, what happens is the tubing line casing is broken. And pneumatic pump and tubing failure, leak or something like that internally or external tubing leak. So most of the time when the pump don't pump properly, you need to replace the pump due to the lack of pressure. And uh, sometimes the pneumatic valve have failed or sometimes broken tubing inside. In, uh, in the long run. So these are things that normally you're going to replace. When you try to connect your NIBP, all that, and you see no leak, but your NIBP is not giving any pressure, that normally the pump is a cause of the problem. SPO2 sensor, so you can see uh, on number two, that's a breaking case. Uh, the casing is break. And number one, you can see the cable are broken, all that. So always make sure that uh, use the right sensor for adult, infant, and neonat. Do not push the finger too deeply into the sensor. So when you push too, too much, you can damage the sensor's uh, expand point. So always avoid that. So you see figure one, the installation failure and damage. This can cause due to the incorrect uh, cleaning solution and uh, may result damage. So when you use incorrect, what happens is the insulator be become hard and it, the cable start to break all that. And sometimes when you try to arrange the cable properly, you cannot push too much. So you have to be careful. So you always use uh, soapy water or 70% isoporic alcohol using soft moisture cloth. You can clean, clean this type of cables, all that, but do not use uh, direct base alcohol. Eventually you're going to break the insulator. So always remember, check the cable, all that carefully and wipe properly. SPO2 sensor, internally you can see you got photo detector and uh, silicon seal and double side tape, all that. So when uh, oximet when you see the light is not picking up, uh, for example, patients, uh, SPO2 will not picking up patient uh, heart rate and saturation, Check the probe, uh, insert properly on the patient and facing upward. And uh, do not force the probe pushing into the patient finger. Check the light of the indicator on the SPO2 working properly. Check the connector. 
then from there you see whether you get the heart rate and saturation or not. So sometime when you fix this particular problem, like the cable broken all that, you can re uh, cut and uh, resolder back. So these are temporary solution. Eventually you need to get a new one. Until then you still can use sometime. For ECG cable, so common problem is ECG no signal due to the ECG gel drying on the connectors. The, insul the insulator broken, resulting signal interface on ECG. So check the lead wire and patient cable electrode connection. Check the lead wire and cable damage by using your multimeter. Continuity test, check whether between the connector to the each lead, whether there, there's any reading in ohms. So once you check all that, if you got reading, that means it still can be used. So another solution is when insulation broke, you can uh, do what you can uh, fix them back by using a wrap foil carefully around the ECG and ensure that the foil is electrically connected to the end of the origin of ECG cable. So you can see step one, step two. So you wrap the foil tightly and electrical tape. So you can see the uh, figure number one. You can see the black tape was wrapped all that as a temporary insulator you still can use actually these are temporary solution until you get a new ecg cables but it works sometimes it works quite quite long actually but at least something from nothing yeah because what happened is you maybe have lack of accessory but by doing this you still can use it until you get a new accessories. So someone have asked about component level troubleshooting. So when you talk about um, um, repairing, power supply normally is not that so complicated if you know uh, each of the part of the power supply and you got proper tool, you still can fix them actually by soldering, iron, all that, and a hot air gun for SMT level uh, level soldering. So most of the modern medical device are designed with few layers of kit. It can go up to seven layers, depend on type of uh, medical device. If it's too complex, it's seven layer. Normally you can see three to four layers, SMD level. So disadvantage with SMT is the space is become small and difficult for repair because everything is shrink, the size becomes small and a solder connection maybe when you heat, using solder, the heat, all that can cause damage on other, other part of it. So you need to know how much of heat need to be used. You cannot use a normal soldering iron because of uh, the component are designed such a way for certain temperature and uh, you need to uh, check the loading of the heat on the system so when you put on the circuit board if too too much of heat your circuit board can expand then can damage the remaining circuit layer in between so you have to be careful with that so if you really want to do smd sm level of repair make sure that you have anti-static uh, table with the anti-static things up put in properly and you need to have a, a SMD removal soldering iron and a air gun all that that and you have to use 
certain things that to measure like a good multimeter all that to do component level Karen okay thanks Gina. um I also give a quick shout out to the Tanzania team from Nusoma Regional Referral Hospital um, they were kind enough to take all of those pictures so that you can see some of the different accessories and some of the real problems that people have with accessories so thank you guys um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ashaver from Addis Ababa Polytechnic College Bard Polytechnic College and he can introduce his team and then they can present their Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the case study on patient monitoring system that we found during maintenance work. So for case one, machine does not turn on. For this case, we have identified the listed problems. Those are loose connection, power supply unit damaged, the power supply, especially switching transformer failed. For those problems, where we have taken those corrective actions. First one, we replace the damaged component with a correct setting. For loose connections, we firmly tighten and fix it. And for switching transformer field, we replace the whole board to avoid complication with, with electrical safety. This is what we did for case one. For case two, for no display, we have identified three problems. For this case, the are loose connection, damaged screen, damaged LCD backlight power inverter board. As you have seen, Below on the photo, the screen damaged the backlight inverter board and the cable uh, which transfers data to the screen. So for these problems, we make the following correct actions. For loose connection, we tighten it and fix it. For screen damaged, it requires a screen replacement because we don't have spare part, we don't have screen, so we are waiting for part to arrive. And for damaged LCD, backlight power inverter board, we replace it by taking out from the discarded one and fix it in. This is what we did for no display. For K3, we found that blur display on the screen. For this, we found that the loose connection of LCD wire and by tighten the loose connection, as you have seen below on the photo, we repaired it. Case four on off switch not working. And for this case, we have identified the problem that membrane cable does not touch internal switch. For this problem, we made modification for this switch and we make contact between the membrane cable and the internal switch. So we make it normal and we fix it through this. Case 5 selector switch not working. This was the case that we found during maintenance work. So the problem that we have identified is push button does not reach the contact point. For this, with the same manner as case 4, we made modification and we fixed it. K5 
K6NIBP cuff does not inflate. This was the case. And for this, we have identified two problems during maintenance work. One, the damaged sensor on main board, and two, NIBP cuff leakage. For this problem, we made the following corrective actions. Both, both of the problems need replacement. So since it needs spare part, and we don't have the spare parts for now, so we're waiting for part to arrive. This is what we did for this case. K7 and at pump failure, for this case, we have identified thus mentioned problems during maintenance work on patient monitoring system. Unit pump failed. There is no power reaching pump. Cable loose or disconnected. For, so for unit pump failed, since it needs replacement and we are waiting for part to arrive for loose connection, we firmly tighten and fix it. KZ MS embedded management switch module display turn off after a few minutes. For this case, um, we, had, we have identified the problem that loose, loose cable connection between LCD and main board. So for this problem, we tighten this loose connection and we fix it. Case 9 MS module can't be interfaced. For this case, we have identified the problem that MS module socketed to the side. This is mainly the problem of the user because users cannot take how to use the machine and general things about this patient monitoring system. So they don't know how to place this module on this patient monitoring system. Because of this, MS module cannot be interfaced with, with the system. So by correctly replacing this module, we repaired it. This is what we did. For case 10, no SPO2 signal detection. This is the case, the, the 10th case that we found during maintenance work. For this problem, we have identified incorrect probe and setting. Most of the time, as I have told you before, end users cannot take training about the machine and they don't know how to use this machine. As you have seen on the photo below, the right side have seven pins and the left side, the right side seven pins and the left one, nine holes. Simply they, so, they socket it, but no support signal detection since some, some signals or some holes are left here. So by using the correct cable as put probe and by, by replacing the correct one, through this we fix it. This is all what I have now for the question. Welcome. All right, thank you so much. And again, thank you to everybody who contributed, um, the Tanzania team, the Addis Ababa Tech Bar and Polytechnic College team. Um, we're very, very grateful to have heard from you. Um, I'm very excited to now bring things to discussion. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Also at this time, as we've done before, we are going to launch a poll. This is how we get feedback from you to plan future sessions, um, and it's very in advance for filling that out. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Benjen, who has been monitoring the chat. Maybe you would like to start asking some questions for the rest of us to respond to. 
Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Aaron. Um, and feel free to um, raise your um, hands. You can um, do that. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, uh, you are also free to unmute yourself uh, if you'd like to make a comment or ask further questions. Um, in the chat, Nahemia, you had brought up um, discussion about infrared uh, thermometers, and I think that is something we can look at um, for a future session. And um, with that being said, oh, I think Ashaber would like to make a comment. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, um, Ashaber. Ashibur, can you hear us? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. And then uh, just I will proceed later. Please go ahead. Well, um, if you have any comments, please feel free to. No, I don't. I don't have any comment. Uh, just uh, I will add in some more, especially what I get from the Gunas slide. So I will. Yeah. Uh, I'll continue later. Please go ahead now. Okay. Uh, we have Kehul Balai um, from Ethiopia. He is from the Tigray region and uh, a friend of ours and has uh, been involved with us in the BMET program out there. Um, he has put a comment in and I'm happy to read that out. All previous sessions, including today's, were so good, but the program focused only on life saving and monitoring equipment. So if it is possible, try to make the next session on equipment, which we were not discussed before, like PCR machine, which is used in diagnosis of coronavirus, because this machine is very critical when we talk about COVID-19. Yeah, Kahula Balai, that's a, that's a great point. We can certainly take a look at that and see uh, what it'll take to put together a module on PCR devices. Not a problem. And I'm so glad that these sessions are helpful um, and in some way um, uh, enhances your biomedical engineering practice. Any questions, any comments? Erin, if you don't mind throwing the slide back on, um, I'd like to perhaps go back to one of the slides Guna uh, was talking about. Can we go to the electrical uh, safety portion, please? Yeah, it's perfect. So um, if you go to, uh, if you go, um, just go past a few slides forward. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, just any of these slides. Guna, so um, when you talk about this type of a circuit, uh, would you be able to elaborate? Um, obviously, you highlighted some of the dangers uh, in modifying um, circuits and using a multimeter to conduct the electrical safety analysis. So if they don't have an electrical safety analyzer, uh, you are talking through a way to do this using a simple multimeter and some components that are available locally. Um, and yes. so when, when someone looks at the circuit uh, that, you're show, uh, that you've drawn out, how could they take this? And what is a practical way for them to actually apply it? How would someone like, um, Tariku or Kolubalai or Ashaber take a look at the circuit and how would they modify the circuit uh, based on these diagrams you're showing uh, in a very practical and safe way? Can I share a photo? Yes, please. Uh, Right, so I did some modification on uh, this particular thing, the ex extension. So these are normal condition and single fault open. So I uh, need to put the cabling, like uh, the, uh, the Maguna cable. Yeah. If, if I could interrupt real quick. So this is um, just a normal grounded power strip, right? Yep, yep. Okay, and so on one of the sockets, no uh, normal condition, 
you haven't yes. modified anything. Yes. And then in the one that says single fault, the SFC neutral open, what did you do there? So I removed the neutral line. So you just simply disconnected the neutral line there? Yep, yep. So when I do the testing, I'm going to remove the plug and move around according to the that's, fault. That's brilliant. And then when you move to the one in the middle, the single fault condition with earth open, what did you do there? I removed the earth. Just disconnected the earth? Yes. That's brilliant. And then the single fault uh, reverse polarity, what did you do there? I, I, I reversed the cable of the live and neutral in the yeah. reverse condition. So simply the live and the neutral uh, wires uh, in the socket just get switched around yep. and you've created the reverse condition, reverse yes. polarity. Yep. That's, an, that's amazing. And so once you connect your, um, your equipment to this, right? Yeah. And then what, where, do you, where do you connect the multimeter? The multimeter should go to the each connect and connection that I remove it, like uh, the neutral remove. So one yeah. of the multimeter cable go, going to go to, going to connect that particular light. And yeah. single fault earth remove, I'm going to connect to the earth. Yeah. And single fault reverse, I'm going to connect from the earth to the equipment. Got it. So, uh, and then the, this, all of this is done with milliampere setting. Milli, millivolt setting on the multimeter. Millivolt and setting, you, right, on the multimeter. Yep. yep. And you do the conversion, one millivolt is equal to one microamp. Got it. Is, I hope that is clear to, um, clear to all of you. I know we, we looked at some of the circuits right and guna very clearly listed out the circuit diagram but this is a very practical safe way for you to be able to do your own electrical safety analysis without um, an electrical safety analyzer you have to be very careful um, as you disconnect the wires on the inside you don't want it to just simply be sitting so you want to be probably put a cap on it or or make sure that it you know it's not touching anything on the inside um, but you can create your own electrical safety analyzer, uh, each of the sockets a, a different condition, and then you use your multimeter, as Guna mentioned, and the settings that Guna mentioned uh, to conduct electrical safety an uh, analysis. Uh, thanks a lot for this, Guna. I, I, th this was very helpful for me. Um, uh, okay. Does anybody else have any more questions or thoughts, any comments? I'm gonna start calling on people. I see Emmanuel Isa on the call. Emmanuel, can you hear us? I think Emmanuel can unmute himself if he can hear us. Hey. Emmanuel, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Welcome. Yes, we can. Um, just a quick introduction. Uh, Emmanuel Isa is with Mercy Ships, um, and he has been working on board the ship as a biomedical engineer. And, um, you know, as you may know, if you've heard of Mercy Ships, they travel to different countries, and the ship is a hospital. It's a floating hospital, and they provide surgical services uh, while they're docked um, um, at, on the coast of a, at the coast of a country. And Emmanuel also has been able to go into some of these countries and organize biomedical engineering trainings. Um, Emmanuel, what are your thoughts on uh, electrical safety? Um, would, you, would you be willing to share um, how, how you've seen this happen on the ship and perhaps what you've seen happen on the ground uh, in some of the West African countries? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Benjin. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's been great uh, being a part of these uh, webinars and just to see 
the presentations. Uh, I'm very impressed by that, and I want to say thank you for that. Um, yeah, so on the ship, um, is pretty much, I would say, like, uh, you know, West world, Western world where, you know, things are done according to the standard, like electrical safety is taken seriously. Uh, we perform electrical safety testing on vehicle equipment before commissioning and before, you know, before we return them into service, we do the electrical safety test. It's just uh, that's how we do that. And in local hospitals, we see that, uh, I mean, the lack of testers or electrical safety analyzers uh, in, in those hospitals. So it's a, it's a big need in those hospitals. And I see also how creative uh, the presenter have, you know, has been in designing the different, uh, how do you call it, uh, single fault conditions. You know, that's pretty yeah. creative and I really like, I really like that. Um, so thank you for presenting. And uh, as we all know, um, for electrical safety is also for the patient safety. And uh, because most of the procedures in the healthcare or in the operating room bypass the natural protection of the patients. So it's important that we, as a biomedical engineers, take uh, electrical safety and patient safety seriously. Because when the patient is asleep and he is being electrocuted, he cannot say anything. So as a biomedical engineers, we are the patient advocate. So we make sure that the patient is safe from an electrical point of view, so that the doctor can also keep the patient safe. I have noticed also in most cases that, in some cases that there are some patients that have been that are affected and the surgeon is not able to, to provide proof of what has caused the death, for instance, because it's not from his side. Maybe it has come from the patient's side. Maybe a leakage current has actually entered the patient during an invasive procedure and has caused maybe a ventricular fibrillation and nothing has been in place to monitor the patient's status and he couldn't wake up. So again, the biomedical, I see him as, a, as an advocate for the, for the patient. And I really enjoy watching your webinars on electrical safety. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant, Emmanuel. Thank you so much for sharing that. Some great thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing. Emmanuel, hopefully you. in a few weeks, he will share some more with us uh, from his experiences on the ship and how he maintains equipment on the ship versus perhaps what he sees on the ground. Uh, and so we're, we're really excited to uh, perhaps in a few weeks to have Emmanuel do some presentations for all of you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Benjamin. Anybody else? I'm going to start calling on a few more people. Um, I see the Musoma biomedical team out of Tanzania logging in. Benedict, if you have any thoughts to share, we'd love to hear. Uh, thank you so much, Benedict, for the help you and your team provided in sending pictures to Guna so he could use that in the presentation. Um, we appreciate your help with all of that. Well, if we don't have any more comments uh, or questions, um, Maz, I'd love to pass it off to you for any, any thoughts you'd like to share. Yeah, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, I think everything has been said. I don't have really any technical you know, stuff to, to add here, but I just would like to thank everyone as you mentioned, from, from the Ethiopian team from Tagbarat, who managed to share their experiences of what they are doing on the ground, actual work they are doing currently. So I would like to thank Ashabur for you know, uh, taking the assignment and mobilizing his team to be able to come up with these nice slides and presenters. So yeah, and uh, we'll have more to go. Uh, from you know uh, sharing experiences and also from doing maintenance work on the ground so yeah uh, uh, thank you very much 
and also from Tanzania, always whenever Guna needs important, you know, uh, pictures, he always get it. So thank you very much. But for Emmanuel, maybe if you can speak, you know, if there is any even grounding uh, staff on the sea, on the ship, when they do uh, maintenance, do they do electrical safety there on patient monitors? Where do they get the grounding? Just a question for him. <laughs> That's a great question. Isolation. Hey. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. That's a very good question. The the ship is is grounded, I believe it or not. Um, and there are I so we have that. engineers. <laughs> so we grounded. We don't we don't use isolate isolation uh, power transformer, but we use a grounding system, and we do electrical safety test as per standard, like either sixty six zero one or sixty two three five three, based on the manufacturer recommendation. So we that so we we do that on a regular basis. Um, so we have our team divided. So our for for the biomed team, we take care of anything that is biomed that is medical devices like medical equipment or electrical medical equipment, and electrical engineering take care of anything from the socket to the transformer or to the generators. Um, so so that's they take care of uh, anything that is the wiring, generators anything like that and we take care of the medical equipment whether it is in the operating room or a ward or eye um, ophthalmology or dental anything like that we take care of everything so we have over 2,000 pieces of equipment that we take care of with the team of two uh, that's incredible 2,000 <laughs> devices two biomeds yeah. on a ship yeah. that has grounding. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You, Manuel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> shall I, do, shall I well, add one more? <laughs> please, Ashabur. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Guna, Binjin, and uh, my team from Tavajja. It was a wonderful presentation from us. And I, I'm going to add one more, I think since the current issue is the more sensitive, especially when we are going to take the patient monitor, uh, since it's related to the, this COVID-19. So we, would, we should have to more care for this uh, and disinfectant of the, this machine. So I'm going to add one more and share our experience, how we can disinfect this uh, patient monitor system. Uh, so I think last time when Mabashi touched some more and uh, try to explain some guidelines regarding this uh, disinfectant. So uh, as you know that we take and we bring it different patient monitors from different hospitals. Therefore, we are trying to passing through around three steps to disinfect these patient monitors. Uh, the first, uh, the first step is just to uh, have uh, cleaned the uh, the machine, which is we bring it from the different hospital by soapy water and the soft clothes, especially before we make on the machine, and uh, we are cleaned this soapy by soapy water and the soft clothes, all those machine. And the second phase, we are cleaned this machine with additionally with detols. So we don't have a disinfectant uh, chemicals for, especially for the medical equipment. Instead, we are using this detol chemical with soft clothes, since the detol is maybe it is maybe recommended by the health profession as well because it is more uh, killing the germs, bacteria. So we can use a detol with the soft clothes in order to further disinfect this uh, patient monitors. Uh, and the, finally, we are trying to uh, clean the entire case of the external machine by the warm water, especially it is going to be around 70 or 80 degrees Celsius warm water by soft clothes. After that, we are going to clean the entire case of the machine by dry clothes in order to dry those machines. And then we are finally transferred to the pre-maintenance layout. 
So we are passing through this step in order to disinfect. Uh, I think this machine, because as you know, this is a critical machine which is directly related to the COVID-19. So we don't know whether the machine is infected by the COVID virus or not. So we should have to pass again the more careful for the disinfectant of the machine. So this is more what I am going to add. Thank you very much. Oh, that's really good. Thank you so much, Ashaber, for sharing that. Very clear, detailed steps on what you're doing at TechBotted to make sure the patient monitors are disinfected and, and safe to be worked on or perhaps even returned back to the hospital. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Well, if that is all we have, um, for today, um, I, I just want to thank you all again for your participation. Uh, please join us same time next week um, for another presentation. Um, Erin, I'm going to hand this over to you. Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. So we have a couple of announcements. Um, next session is going to be uh, very fun. We're going to do some experience sharing uh, from all over the world. So come prepared to share your story. Um, and share a little bit about how COVID has affected your facility and your career. Um, we're also going to be working on a little bit of a project this week with hopes to launch next week. Um, the goal would be to not only support during webinars once a week, but also to kind of connect everybody in things like WhatsApp and Telegram groups and connect people one-on-one um, -on -one based on their skills and what their specialties are to people who maybe don't share that specialty mm -hmm at the hospital with that specialty. Um, so we'll give you more details about exactly how that works next week, but look forward to it, invite your friends, and we're very excited to support you better. Um, and with that, I will let you all get back to your day. Thank you so much for participating and so much for um, attending.